Hi everyone, thank you for coming and really excited to make this event finally happen. Um, it's cool to have so many people in the room that I actually have a personal relationship with. So it's uh, every person that's in the room always adds like a new vibe to the room and like one person leaves, it's sort of like a minion. A minion of 10, of 10 men. When there's nine people, it's not a minion. And when it's a 10, suddenly everything goes up. Every single person has such infinite importance. So I'm so glad to make this happen. Um, this, the main idea of this event started when Ephraim and I have been actually talking about this for many, many years about doing this. Ephraim is an incredible healer. He is not very knowledgeable for over 30 years. He studied every possible um, healing uh, methodology. And for years, I have been learning from him. He makes a lot of content very interesting material, and I usually almost always get a session when, I, when I'm with him. And now he, uh, he, asks, he always asks questions of the big Rabbanim in Yerushalayim. When you live in Yerushalayim, you have access to the big people to ask questions about what's permissible and what's not permissible. So Ephraim is a seeker of truth and a great friend of mine, and we've been through a lot together, so it's great to finally make this event happen. I get the opportunity to speak basically every week, uh, multiple times at Baycrest Hospital, where I'm a rabbi there, a chaplain, a psychotherapist. And so a lot of what I do there is basically under the category of what we call spiritual care. And I was talking to a doctor this Shabbos and he, he was talking about the notes because we actually chart our notes in the computer about what we do. And he was like, yeah, we never look at any of your guys' notes. It's all just gobbledygook. <laughs> and I was thinking, that's not true because, you know, a lot of times we actually get involved in medical halacha, life and death circumstances. And what a zahud it is to be, at the end of some, to be there at the end of somebody's life, life to walk aside them and to shepherd them. We're talking about some of the last Holocaust survivors in the world. So it's a big zahud to do that. As part of my training through uh, Baycrest and uh, CAMH, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, I also became a, um, a registered psychotherapist. And I've been seeing patients for a number of years. Even before that, I was seeing as a therapist, now as a psychotherapist. Um, I guess I've become psycho in the meantime. And, um, and so now, for a while now, besides with some of my private clients, I'm also going to start producing more content, which is where this starts. In the past, I made Torah content, but now I want to start doing more self-help universal content. And this tonight is a, a way to, uh, to move all this forward with a lot of the special stuff that I've been working about, thinking about, and studying for the last number of years. I'm going to prevent, uh, present a few of those ideas here tonight. So I'm excited to kind of get, out, get this out there and hopefully we'll try to make it a little interactive, ask some questions and see what you guys think about certain situations. Um, so this lecture is called Living Your Truth, Manifesting Integrity in Relationships. So as everyone knows, I always usually like to start with a joke. And so uh, a couple of days ago, a friend of mine, uh, Rabbi Ori Bergman in Buffalo, told me a joke and so I thought I would just uh, steal his joke. I don't know if I could credit to him, but uh, he was the one who told it to me. So he, this is the situation. There's a rabbi... I was a rabbi, a doctor and a lawyer, and they're talking in Kiddush on Shabbos after davening. And the doctor turns to the lawyer and he says, you know what, I'm just, I, can't, I can't even have a Shabbos. Every Shabbos, people are coming to me, asking me questions. They think it's Shabbos, and that they think I don't want to have a day off. All day long, I mean, questions, people are knocking on my door. What do I do about this situation? I'm sick of having to give people advice on Shabbos and all the time. And so the lawyer says, listen, I have an idea for you. He says... Next time someone asks you for advice, you send them a, uh, an invoice in the mail. They'll take care of the problem, I, I promise. So uh, the doctor, oh, that's a great idea. Of course, why shouldn't I do that? What, Shabbos? Well, whatever. The main idea is just to get them to stop. Anyway, goes home. He's so excited about this. A couple days later, comes home from work, opens up the mailbox, finds an invoice from the lawyer in the mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> all right. The Gemara says you should always open any lecture with a, mil a milsa de bedichusa, like a joke. You know, the idea is to make your heart more receptive to sometimes the serious things that we're going to talk about. So I want to move right into that. Um, okay, so the, the name of my lecture tonight is called Living Your Truth, Manifesting Integrity in Relationships. And I know it sounds kind of new agey and just, you know, very general, but I actually intend to present exactly that topic. So first I want to do is uh, tell you what does living your truth mean to me. I do a lot of self-work on myself as well as working with clients, and I have a, uh, a VOD of guys I work with, I'm not going to mention their names, who I work with every week, and we're always sending messages to each other about how to improve our lives and making things better. And the, the current catch word we're using is living your truth. So what does living your truth mean? So the definition I'm going to give, and I think everyone kind of really just knows what living your truth is, but the definition I'm going to give is being your authentic self at every given moment. How do we do that? 
You have to have an honest recognition of your strengths, your convictions, and your beliefs. A lot of people are really unhappy about what happens to them in the world. They're seeing themselves as a victim that things are happening to them in the world. The reality is things do happen. There's a God in the world and there's other people in the world. But when it comes down to it, we have to take responsibility. And that means that our beliefs that we hold about ourselves is going to affect our actions. And those actions are going to make the results that we get in the world. It's that simple. Your beliefs become your actions. Your actions will influence your results. Again, there's others involved. And we're going to talk about that because the second part of the lecture is manifesting integrity in relationships. So you might know yourself, but that's not going to be enough. So besides being your authentic self, we must also see clearly our negative imprints from the past. There's been discussion among some of uh, my rabbi friends about how much we should delve into negativity or not. Regardless of whether you should del delve into it, there's two schools of thought of that in uh, psychology. You must know your weaknesses. You must know what you've been through. If you've been through hard upbringing, if you've been through some hard relationships, some trauma and work, you got to recognize that. Why do you need to recognize that? Because that, those are going to form your beliefs, which again are going to form your actions, which are going to form your results. If you walk into a job interview and you are walking like Nebuch, like you're nothing because of all your bad experience in the past, that's a result of your beliefs. So clearly, and that's a result of the negative imprints. No baby comes into the world with negative, with negative imprints. We all have our, our good things and bad things about us, but regardless, most of what we pick up besides our genetic imprint and what's naturally found in our neshama is from our environment. Okay. And the last thing is recognizing your real feelings and dealing with them. Being honest about how you feel about things. And we're going to talk about later in, not only is it in, that you have to be honest with yourself about how you feel with things, you need to honestly express yourself through relationships. And we're going to talk about that. When I say relationships tonight, I mean all relationships. I'm not talking about romantic relationships. I'm talking about family relationships, friends, work, every person that you meet in your interaction. So it's going to be a very general topic, but you're going to see that I'm going to hopefully pass on some tools tonight, some of which you may have heard before, but maybe not in this format. So manifesting integrity in relationships is using your authentic self, recognizing your negative imprints, and being in touch with your feelings, and using all that to positively influence what we do in the world in a productive way, which is positive for yourself and useful for other people. Okay. So we're going to break it down into the three sections, and that's, what we're, that's really all we're going to cover. Um, and that's the basic sections are who you are, how to relate to others, and the final will be living your truth, which is the, uh, the title of the class tonight. Okay. Living your truth, again, means being your authentic self, recognizing your strengths, convictions, and beliefs, and supplementing them. So how can we be our authentic self? So um, I like to listen to a lot of content. When I'm driving in my car, thanks for coming, Rabbi. Um, there's uh, some various guys I listen to. One of them, and I feel it's not right for me to give over anything without saying who they were. So there's somebody I've listened to who's actually from Toronto named Richard Cooper. And some of those things he says, I think, are really about, uh, about self-growth. There's two things that he says I think are extremely important and have affected me very deeply and are applicable for every person. The first one is called, he calls, being your own mental point of origin. It's kind of a technical term, but it basically means defining yourself by yourself. That's it. I want to give you an example. And I want to make some personal examples because I think stories, you know, the, the secret of Hasidic teaching as well as the Talmud is that by telling stories, we, we make things much more real. This is all a bunch of intellectual information. So I'm going to tell some story, a few stories related to my lecture, and I also want you guys to uh, get interactive. Um, so I'm going to ask you some questions as well. Not personal, but just how, what you would do in a certain scenario. Okay. There's a time in my life where I was going through a difficult relationship. And I wanted to uh, make things better. Or I thought I did. And the problem was about my interactions was that every mood and action that I would have was directly influenced by how this other person was treating me. Right? This person treated me nicely that day, sent me a nice email. I'd feel good, I'd feel elated. If it was a negative situation, I would feel very negative. But that's people, right? People are up and down. It is insane to make our own self-worth and our own sense of being 
based on how other people are treating us. Can you think of anything more insane than that? We've got to be our own stable mental point of origin. We have to look at ourselves as ourselves and be good in ourselves. Always accept ourselves for who we are. Um, I could give a million examples of this, but I think you guys all know what I'm talking about. You know, at work, your boss sends you a little scary of an email, freak it out, freak it out. Then you find out later that he was just in a bad mood or she was just, uh, you know, you misunderstood what they were saying. It's crazy. It's crazy. You know, one of my favorite, uh, I would definitely want to bring some Torah into this. So one of my favorite, a photographer came and he asked me what my favorite Pusik is because he took some pictures of me for a rabbi book that he's making. And I told him my favorite Pusik is actually, it's a meditation, a meditative Pusik. It's in Pars, Parshish, uh, I believe it's in Re'e. And there it says, remember the way that God brought you all these years, how he tested you to afflict you, to order to know whether you would, you would follow Hashem and believe in his mitzvahs or not. And then it says, your foot did not falter. Your clothes did not wear out. You always had enough to eat. And I think when we meditate on the past, we can realize that we always had everything exactly the way it was supposed to be. No one would change what's gone, what they've gone through for somebody else's story. You'd always want it to be your story. I mean, obviously there's some extreme examples. I work with a lot of survivors, you know, but um, it's amazing to me among them how attitude can determine how much, whether they have this mental point of origin, this sense of self, which is so secure, will determine so much of what their life looks like, everything. You can see people who were just absolutely devastated, and I see people who built beautiful families and grandchildren, they come and visit them, and they're happy, and you're like, this person went through the Holocaust. Yes, they did. Um, Okay, so that's making yourself your own mental point of origin. I think people can frame that in many different ways, right? So the second, and second point Richard Cooper speaks about, again, he didn't teach these necessarily in the same video, but he speaks both, both these a lot, is what I call becoming the best version of yourself. It means you have to constantly be going up, constantly looking for the next step, the next thing you're supposed to do, right? If you're good at something, recognizing those things you're good at and making yourself better at those things. And the things you're not so good at, either working on them or recognizing that maybe, hey, I'm a five foot 10 Jewish kid. I'm not going to slam dunk a basketball on a 10 foot hoop. You know, during high school, I really wanted to become a good basketball player. And I got to the point where I could shoot a decent free throw, but that's it. Like there's only so much material you can work through here, right? But I know what the things I am good at. I'm creative. So that's why we're here tonight. So that's what I'm working on. I'm not here, you know, I'm not shooting 10,000 free throws. Like, um, <clears throat> who's the Boston Celtic who did that? The famous Boston Celtic? Larry Bird. Larry Bird. Okay. So, wait a second, you say, Adam, that sounds contradictory. One, you say, it's accept yourself for who you are. Others said, make yourself a best version of yourself, right? So it's true. One has, they're both true and they're not contradictory. Right now, everything is exactly the way it's supposed to be and you must accept yourself for who you are. But for the future, you have to constantly be improving because as I was told in yeshiva, life is like an escalator going down. So if you're not, and you're walking up, so you have to constantly be moving or you're going to be going down. Because let's face it, as we get older, you know, when I was a kid, my son sometimes says to me, you know, I wish I was an adult, I had all the freedom, he'd be able to play video games, whatever he wants, right? Not have to do his homework. But when you're an adult, we see that it's very different. Responsibilities, problems, financial stuff builds up. It gets harder and harder and harder and harder. So if we're not constantly moving up, how are we going to deal with the bigger and bigger avalanche, the snow that's coming down, right? So besides the fact that you need to accept yourself and make yourself your own mental point of origin, the reality is, is you have to constantly be improving because you're not going to accept yourself and make yourself the own mental point of origin if you don't, aren't constantly growing. We constantly need to be moving. We need to be walking. We need to be going forward, right? Addressing your weaknesses and getting better at the things that you're good at will give your life a sense of growth, a sense of accomplishment, right? And maybe it's a smaller area than others, but we all have gifts that we can get better at. Okay, so I want to finish up section one, but I want to throw some Torah into it because I know some of you out there are asking yourself, how can it be that it's all about you? Like, it's not all about you, right? There's God in the world. We believe in in a God in the world and we're involved with God. So one of my favorite Torahs is the very Ikari, very Yesodistic Torah of of the Holy Baal Shem Tov, on the Pasuk, Shaviti Hashem Tamid. It means, I place God before me always. 
And there's many different ways of interpreting it, but the, the way that the Baal Shem Tov interprets it is he's saying is, I have shaviti, I have hishtavut, I have equanimity because God is before me always. Meaning it's my very sense of self is, is the fact that God is everywhere and everything is exactly the way it's supposed to be. He goes on to say, if you have bread and salt to eat or you have fancy steak and wine, it's all the same because it's exactly what God wants at that moment, right? If it's, if someone, if I have 20 people show up here tonight or if 100 people show up here tonight, does it make a difference? Because every person that's here is exactly who's supposed to be here at this moment, right? It's insane to chase after this stuff. I mean, what are we chasing after? Facebook likes, chasing after who called me? It's crazy. It's just, it's a, no, it's a non-ending thing. We have to stay still, accept who we are, make yourself your own mental point of origin, but at the same time, constantly moving up. Okay, so in the interest of time, I want to move on to the second section because we only have three. This is where it's going to get tricky. How to relate to others. You should never help anyone at all. Okay, I didn't 100% mean that, but I'm, on, I'm going with that idea. What do I mean you should never help anyone? Okay, why do I mean that you should never help anyone? This is the thing. What does help really mean? Whenever you want to help somebody else, you have to ask yourself three questions. What does this person really want and need? Like, what are they asking of me? Second question, which is equally important, is what is my personal motivation and stake in what they're at, in, in this? Right? In psychology, we call this like projection, transference, etc. The last question is, am I really helping them? And maybe I'm also possibly hurting people as well with what I'm doing. So many people have hurt people and destroyed people thinking they were doing a mitzvah. You'd be surprised. So I'm going to give you an example here because this is all very vague. Okay? Some of these examples I'm really afraid to give over. I don't really know if I should because they're, they're real extreme. Um, okay. Let's just, let's just give this an example. Let's give this an example. I'm going to use this example because I think this one, no one's going to be triggered by this one. Somebody comes to you and says that someone in your work is stealing and abusing people, just doing really bad things to other people. And they feel really upset and hurt that this person did it to, did it, did it to them. They feel really upset that this person did it to them. Right? So we shouldn't help this person, right? That's what I'm saying. Not exactly. Let's go through our three questions here and see here. When this person comes to me and says, they, they're coming to me with this whole emotional outburst of how they feel abused or hurt by some of their work and this person's doing a bunch of bad things. First of all, most of us here are Jewish and we know the laws of Lashon Hara. Like, are we allowed to believe a bad report about somebody? when they come to you? Are we allowed just to believe that? Right? Okay, so that's, that's, that's the basic thing what I mean don't help anyone. What does this person really want or need? I will say, judge to say that 95% of the time, not just a number, but a large, as a, as a therapist who's seen thousands of people in Baycrest and, and a number of people outside as well in, in my practice, um, most of the time people just want to be heard and listened to. They really don't want your advice at all. At all. They'll tell you and you'll know when they want your advice. For sure don't give unsolicited advice. No doubt about that. But now I'm talking about what if somebody comes to you and they're like, oh my God, what should I do? If they're in an emotional situation, clearly what they're saying is, listen to me, be present. You train yourself on this. I'm telling you, I thought when I came into my job at Baycrest five years ago that I was going to be like the best therapist there, the best rabbi, chaplain. No. The number one thing you have to train yourself is when someone comes to you with something, you just say, I'm sorry to hear that. I hear it. I'm sorry. That's really hard. That's really what people want to hear, right? They're, you're walking with them, right? I can't fix them. I can't fix this other person. I'm not going to change them. They just want to be heard and acknowledged. And maybe you don't even agree with them. You don't, it doesn't matter. I hear you. You're feeling really bad. That's so, that's, I'm so sorry. You know? I've had people say, don't even hand them a tissue box. Because it's all under the realm of fixing, changing. Like, they can't go get a tissue if they need a tissue. Like, be present to whatever their needs are. Just be an emotional 
antenna for them, right? What's my personal motivation and stake in all this, right? This is a tricky one. And it's not, this sounds a little floaty, but I want you to know that as a professional, we have a very important thing that every year we have to uh, do a, a unit in something called safe and effective use of self, which means that I have to be very careful that I am not putting myself too much into the situation. When I walk home at night, when I'm done with my clients, I have to, to be able to put that aside and move home, go home. And it goes much, much deeper than that because all of us and all our relationships are constantly reliving and rehashing the things that have happened to us in our previous relationships, good and bad. And we're putting that into it, right? So what's my personal motivation and stake in this? I can tell you this. When I, I want to tell you how crazy I was when I first got to my work. When you hear this, you guys are going to think, this guy's totally nuts. I walked into my work on the first day at an old age home with people in their 90s, okay? There's a palliative care hospice in my, in my home, right? I, I, I really thought this. I said, I'm going to daven, I'm going to pray, and no one is going to die here. Like, who thinks that? What I'm, what I, who do I think I am? Like, I'm not God. And I, that's what I thought. I had to come to terms with what I call a savior complex, which means is I am somehow getting my own needs fulfilled through helping and saving somebody, right? And I had to take, get rid of that big time. When I went through my training, I had to go through two years of training on this stuff, and we were doing this every week. Gotta take yourself out of the picture, man. It's not about me. It's, about, it's not about me. It's about them. It's 100% about them. I'm a professional. It's about them. I cannot save anybody. I can only walk with somebody to help them see on their, with their own discoveries about what, what, they, what their feelings are and what maybe they want to change. I've tried. I've tried changing a lot of people, fixing a lot of people. It doesn't work. It really, it's hard enough to try to change yourself, right? Okay, so I don't want to belabor the point because I made my point there. But the last is, am I really helping them? Like, am I really helping them, right? So at that moment, I feel like I'm helping them when I'm saving them or whatever, but I'm not because in the long run, they've got to learn to help themselves. Right? This is now, I'm introducing tonight in this class a new term. I Googled it. I did not find this. I found this on one website, but it had nothing to do with this. It's definitely not been Googled. The trademarked it here tonight. Don't anyone go home and buy the URL tonight. And this is the term. Chaim likes it. Chaim was the one who told me about the URL toxic empathy. Toxic empathy is when you, when you think you have empathy, you're emotionally resonating with somebody else and their situation but it has absolutely nothing to do with them, it's about you. I definitely don't want to belabor this, it's too controversial a topic, but I will say that I see this the most between the relationships between men and women. When it comes to men's rights, female rights, accusations, the guy was this, the girl was this, all sorts of stuff that we see in the religious community a lot. When there's a cause for a woman or a cause for a man, it's like, we, it's like the Gemara says, there's two separate armies, we just jump into a camp. Because we have so, there's such a, look at, we have this barrier between both the sides here. I guess I'm on both sides, but a little more on this side. And we're, we're constantly trying to, uh, you know, reaffirm and confirm confirmation bias, what we know and what we feel. Maybe this man isn't a bad guy. Maybe he's a good guy. Maybe this woman isn't a bad lady. She's a good lady. We don't know. So at the end of this, I'm going to say this. So how, what do we do then when somebody comes to you with a problem? Right? As I said, you don't help them. You don't help them. You do nothing. You listen to them. You're present for them. You 100% accept and at least pretend that you believe what they're saying. That they walk away feeling listened to and all their emotions and turmoil got out. But then the day you don't do anything. Okay? You don't. Because most of the time, you're going to end up doing more damage. They're not going to listen to you. You might be hurting another party and you don't know whether yourself. If you could truly go through those three stages which I told you about, which are, what does this person really need? What's my stake in it? And am I really helping them? Then at the end of the, I guess what Baal Shem Tov would say, taking your nigiyas, your personal motivations out of everything you do, that's a pure motive. But since most of us can't really do that, you shouldn't do anything. You should listen to them, be present, be present. I want to give one caveat though, because I don't want you to walk away there. It's a clear emergency situation. In that situation, like a woman's coming and she's battered and it's obvious that she's battered. You can see it's not just like a story because she's upset at her husband. Obviously, you help that person. If somebody in the street, you know, is in, it's an accident, it's a, if it's a child, obviously, a child doesn't have enough agency, right? Someone there. Of course, see, all these underlying motivations is what 
is where this whole advocacy thing comes in. And a lot of people theorize that we don't do anything in the world unless we have our own personal stake in it, right? In some sort of way. The Tanya actually talks a little about that, about what personal motivations are for people. But I want to say that when it comes to these type of things, when it comes to saving people, most of the time, and I can speak for myself as someone who's been thinking about this and learning about this and training in this, it's mostly about us. We've got to take ourselves out of the picture. And you only help that person when you know they have no other way to help them. You for sure don't advocate to the sense that you're going and getting yourself involved in some big cause when you don't know the whole situation. You don't know what he said, you don't know what she said, did, et cetera. I see this all the time and I see people's lives ruined and children's lives ruined. I won't go on more length about this. I think you guys know what I'm talking about. Okay. All right, so that's it. Let's go to the last section. Living your truth. Okay, so now we established about, let's just run over to what we learned so far. One is becoming your own mental point of origin, meaning is you always have to, you have to basically be unflappable. You have to be your own sense of self, regardless of what others think about you. It is absolutely insane to judge yourself by the way your child treats you, the way your kid, your spouse, your boss, someone who cuts you off in traffic, that's going to ruin my day. Yeah, it does sometimes, right? We've got to get to the point where we love ourselves enough to do that. And maybe we can use the Baal Shem Tov's idea of realizing how precious and connected we are to God. Rabbi Nachman also speaks about this a lot um, in the Torah Zamra, about we, we have to find, the way we find good in ourselves is by looking and searching and searching for the good things we've done inside of ourselves. It's a good way to reconnect to ourselves and to our infinite source. So the second one, that's becoming your mental point of origin. The second one is becoming the best version of yourself because if you're not moving forward as life gets more and more complex, you're going to find yourself overwhelmed. So you constantly have to be working on yourself one way or another. Become the best version of yourself. That could mean physically. Go to the gym, man. Stop eating so much junk. Or it could mean um, educating yourself. Going and getting more education. This day and age, careers are going up and down. It's not like when your old days you went to university or got education, that was it. You are set for your life. You got to be working all the time. I mean, I never thought I was going to be doing, standing up here today and talking about psychotherapy and self-help. But that's the way, that's what I got interested in. And that's what I've been training and learning about. And that's, that's great. So, and we talked about uh, working with others, i.e. Um, toxic empathy, savior complex, the three questions. Right, there's one thing I, I forgot to add on that. We're not gonna really have much time to get too much into it because I want to uh, give time for Fryam. But I just want to say something that's very important, which I should have said at that time. It's called the victim triangle. You picture a triangle, and then here's the perpetrator, and here's the victim. Let's call them the so-called perpetrator and the so-called victim, because that's really what I'm trying to say here. There's this other person, right? This other person is you. This victim, quote unquote, comes to you and asks you for help. Now you're involved in the triangle, right? Now you're in a relationship with this, with this person um, the, who is a victim and you're believing them. And now you're in this relationship with this perpetrator, right? And the perpetrator now, you're taking on all the burden of the victim and the victim is not becoming what they need to be. They need to stand up for themselves and start to assert and become the person they're going to be. But you're taking on all the whole role for them. And what you're training is this. You're teaching the perpetrator that he's a bad person. You're treating the victim that he's a victim or she's a victim. And you're putting yourself as the role of the savior, which again is usually coming from the bad, a bad motive. There's a lot more to talk about the victim triangle, but it's not good. It's called triangulation. And that's basically why marriage counseling doesn't work. People don't go, marriage counseling almost always ends up in towards bad ends. Why? Because one of the parties sees themselves as a victim and they're trying to get the, the therapist to agree with them. And nobody likes to be picked on. No one wants two against one, particularly when it's professional. It's very difficult as a professional. I don't do marriage counseling, but I have sometimes worked with sit hard situations. I work with like inheritances and stuff like that. Where like, and that's also a very heated situation. And you got to be very careful to get yourself neutral. That's a perfect example of not getting pulled into saving somebody and let the person represent themselves. You got to let this person become themselves, right? So <clears throat> again, we're not going to talk anymore about that. So to end up, to end up, I want to just give a few, uh, a few pointers about this idea of living your truth. Living your truth may hurt at the moment, but will always give you amazing results in the long run. Whereas not living your truth may be okay in the moment, but in the long run will cost you. So um, I was talking to somebody recently who spoke about um, someone who was very aggressive to them and strong to them. And the person was just sort of shy away until the moment would go away, right? 
it seems that, and this person seemed that reasonably it would be a way to deal with the situation. If you just kind of shy and back away from the situation, that will fix the situation. It will end. The pain will end. So right, the pain does end at that moment, right? So heroin as well, if you take it, or morphine, it will end the pain in the moment, right? But you're not getting to the root cause of what's going on here. The root cause that's going on here is at that, every time that you shy away in that interaction, but to, when someone's trying to oppress you, you're one, you're telling this person, hey, it's okay to be a bully. You're affecting me. I can see that. Your emotions are, are my, my behavior, my emotions is belying how I really feel about what's going on here. And you're, you are getting rewarded for your behavior. And for me, I'm constantly, constantly, I think they call it death by a thousand paper cuts. I'm slowly, slowly over many years telling myself that I'm not worth enough. I'm not strong. I can't stand up for myself. I'm not good enough. Constantly, constantly. So at the moment it may be okay, but in the long run, you're not living your truth, it's gonna cost you because in the end you're making this person a bigger bully and you're making yourself a bigger victim until the point where you're just stuck, right? So that's why that doesn't work. Eventually you will burst and you will have a moment like that. There was one person in my life, some of you, I'm not gonna obviously say any names, but some of you I've told this story to, who was oppressing me for many years, and at one point, it just, I just blew up. And I got aggressive. And it changed all the abuse, I can tell you that. Right? So it was good in that regard that it reframed the whole relationship. The abuser stopped being an abuser, and the victim stopped being a victim. I stopped being a victim. But the cost that I had in that moment was that I was alienated from that person for another five more years. If I had said getting aggressive and pushing this person, which I did, and that's the only time I've ever pushed anyone in my whole life or been any physical altercation with anyone. And that's all I did is push this person once. If I had just said, no, I don't like what you're saying to me. I don't like how, you, how, how it feels when you say that to me. I don't appreciate that. It's really hard to do in the moment, right? Me and Rev Avram were talking about it. If you can just pull yourself away for like three to five seconds and just go into the other room and then come back, you can say that. So we have to train ourselves to say that. Express our emotions, assert ourselves. Never be aggressive, assert yourself. I don't, I don't, and it's always about you and not about them. I don't feel good, um, Mike, when you talk to me like that. Um, my boss, not my boss, my actual boss, but to say a boss. Um, I think that's a little bit too much to ask of me. I don't think I'm, I'm capable of doing that today. Right? What we want to say is, no, I hate you, no, 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 no. no. You will solve it. All they have to hear is your feelings. It's about you. It's not, it's not about them. It's about you. Your feelings. And your feelings are never wrong. Actions can be wrong. Words can be wrong. But the second you act out, now suddenly this person has, has turns you into the aggressor and they're the victim. And that's what happened. This person who was so, you know, not nice to me, for five years later, this person became the victim and I was the bad guy. Right? Okay. So... Let's just, to wrap up here, the closer we get to our purpose, the more we find ourselves in the infinite light of, of God, the more we live our truth, the more we will attract all the good things that life has to offer. We have to stop trying, stop trying to please people, stop trying to promote ourselves and just become the best we we can be and they will come. The spiritual care approach, which I, I, I based on, is based on Viktor Frankl's uh, A Man in Search of Meaning. I don't know if you've read the book. Brilliant book. Um, he basically talks about the people who were able to make it through the Holocaust, and he said the people who made it through the Holocaust were those who found a reason to go on. For his reason was that he had a manuscript about psychology that he had written, and it was lost, and he, wanted, he was thinking about it the whole time. He lost the manuscript, he was thinking about it when he was in the concentration camp, and he wanted to produce it because that was his magnum opus. For others, they survived because they wanted to re be reunited with somebody they hoped was still alive. The muscle men, they're called, the people who didn't, is the people who gave up hope. As spiritual care, as professional, we try to live our lives and help other people walk with them to find meaning, purpose, and hope. The secret of life, according to me, is that life is meant to be lived. When you start seeing your life as an adventure, and then you can go up and down. And I actually stole that from the movie, movie Parenthood. You guys ever seen the movie Parenthood? The whole roller coaster uh, par parable at the end, right? Life's like a roller coaster, right? Sometimes it goes up and sometimes it goes down, but it's all part of the adventure. It's part of the ride. When you see your life as an adventure and life is meant to be lived, you'll have a lot more hope and a lot less regret. Okay, so thank you guys so much. I hope I didn't, I don't know how long I went, but I hope you guys enjoyed. 
And uh, all the teachings I gave tonight were teachings that I try to live by and it affected me deeply. So I hope you guys could feel that and resonate with that. Um, I want to introduce now, Ephraim, are you ready? So I'm ready to our main act for tonight, the in uncomparable Ephraim Geltman, who is going to, uh, well, I'll let him speak for himself, but he is an expert healer um, and knowledgeable in all sorts of paradigms, including how natural healing interacts with Jewish law. So um, he's available for the next week. You can, uh, if you like him, you can speak with him afterwards. You can uh, make a consultation with him. But I highly recommend him because he is also my personal hero and the person I go to is my go-to guy. He helps me tremendously in my life. So again, I also want to thank Rav Avraham Gisselson, um, his wife and family, Breslov, Toronto, and Call Your Rhyme Congregation, and everyone for making this event happen. This is, this is, a, this is Rav Avraham's home and that he does this every week. This is the most amazing shul in Toronto, bar none. If I didn't have to be down south, everybody knows I would be up here every Shabbos. So when I come here, I feel like it's Mamash like Eretz Yisrael. And I, I love this guy, his mom is a brother. Okay, Ephraim Geltman, everybody. Yeah.